Well, hello everyone. My name is Mike Decker and welcome to uh, Palm Harvest Church and welcome to my living room here in Costa Mesa, California. For those of you who might be tuning in for the first time, I'm super glad that you're here. For you regular uh, viewers, I'm especially glad that you're here. And most of you probably know that we are in this new series called Words, W-O-R-D-S, Words. And so if you're taking notes, whether it be in paper, uh, old school, and a pen, or if you have your, your Palm Harvest Church app, here are the two words that we're going to sort of talk about today. You ready? They are the word pain and the word fear. Pain and fear. Now, here's the big idea for our conversation today. Pain cripples, fear imprisons, Jesus liberates. That's what we're gonna talk about today. Pain cripples, fear imprisons, but Jesus liberates. Now, if you have a Bible, I wanna invite you to turn in it to the Gospel of Matthew, or rather Mark, chapter five. Now, whether it's in paper like this or digital form, a lot of cool Bible apps out there for you to grab onto. Go to Matthew, rather Mark, <laughs> Mark chapter five. Now, a little uh, background for those of you who might be new to uh, the Bible. In the New Testament, there are like kind of two sections in the Bible. There's an Old Testament, which talks about everything that prior to the, the, the point of Jesus, the life of Jesus. And then the New Testament takes kind of the birth of Jesus and then goes forward to the beginning of the early church. Well, in the first four books of the New Testament, consisting of 27 books, there are what we call the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And really what these Gospels tell the story is of Jesus' life. And so today we're going to read a story out of Mark chapter 5. And the fact that it's at the beginning of this gospel tells us that we're really at the beginning of Jesus' kind of earthly ministry, okay? He's kind of beginning his uh, earthly, uh, kind of his ministry tour, tour. And right off the bat, as we're going to see here in Mark chapter 5, is where Jesus' sort of supernatural authority is showcased, okay? So as I try to do every every uh, talk, I invite you to picture the scene in your mind. Um, let's read a couple verses and then I'll, then I'll open in prayer, okay? So Mark chapter five, I'm gonna start reading at verse one. So they arrived at the other side of the lake in the region of the Gerasenes. Now let's stop there, who's they? Well, Jesus and his disciples, what lake? Well, we know it's the Sea of Galilee, and they're in the region of the Gerasenes. Some of your translations might say uh, the Gadarenes. It's, a, it's the same area, but basically they're the around, the, around the Sea of Galilee. Verse 2. When Jesus climbed out of the boat, a fishing boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in burial caves and could no longer be restrained even with a chain. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrists and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Day and night, he wandered around the burial caves and the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him, and bowed low before him. Now let's stop there. Let me say a quick word of prayer and then we'll jump in, okay? Our Heavenly Father, today as we dig into this story of your son Jesus, we pray that you would teach us something new. And specifically, Father, I ask that you would help us to identify maybe what fears exist in our own life, help us to identify maybe the pain that we are crippled by, and then, then give us the courage to believe that through your son Jesus, we might defeat it. That's my hope, that's my prayer. Father, I pray this in, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let me give you a scenario. 
I'm curious to know how many of you have ever been chased by a dog, right? You know, I can remember as a kid when, when my family was, was vacationing up in Canada in Penticton, which is a beautiful kind of a resort area. I can remember this, this occasion when my cousins and I were sort of meandering down this back alley when all of a sudden this dog comes bolting out of someone's backyard and starts chasing us. Now, we later learned that this dog was a retired police dog, <laughs> which is never a good thing. And so we did what you probably would have done had you been in our sneakers. We ran, right? We, we scattered we, and we were screaming like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, we're gonna die, we're gonna die. Well, my brother, my brother Murray was the one who kind of came out on the short end of the stick. He lost out on the deal because he was the one who got bit. Now, I don't know what it is about my brother Murray and dogs, but it always seemed like he was the one who would get attacked, uh, which by the way, is it's always a good thing to have uh, with you anytime you're getting in, uh, into mischief. You gotta have someone take it for the team, and so Murray was always a good guy <laughs> to bring along. Now, now, I love this story, obviously, because it helps me visualize kind of what's going on here in, in Mark chapter 5. Now picture the scene in your mind. So Jesus and his disciples, they're, they're, they're climbing out of this boat, and immediately we are told that a demon-possessed man comes running at them. He comes, he sees them obviously coming across the water. As soon as they set foot on ground, pew, this demon-possessed man is like hauling toward Jesus and his disciples. Now this story, this experience here, leads me to believe, and you're not gonna change my attitude on this, it leads me to believe that I think Jesus was kind of a prankster, right? Uh, now, now, now think about this. Half of Jesus' disciples we know were fishermen, right? They were professional fishermen. They made their living along the Sea of Galilee. And so I venture to say that there's a strong likelihood that if you were a fisherman who made his or her living along the, the seashore of, a, sea sh of a, 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 a body of water like this, that there's a strong chance that you probably knew where the best fishing spots were. You probably knew at what time of the day the fish would bite. Maybe there's some places were better than others. I suspect that Jesus' fishermen likely knew where the best place along this, the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee was to find uh, you know, the, the best fish and chips or maybe a hot bowl of clam chowder. In fact, I suggest that if there was a location along the Sea of Galilee that was famous for having a demon-possessed man living in it, a guy who iron chains and shackles could not contain, a man who was in the habit of wandering the burial caves and the hills screaming like a, a, a rabid wolf, terrorizing all the villagers, I want to suggest that I don't think it's a stretch to think and believe that this, these fishermen knew were very aware of this particular area. Yes, is that, would you agree with me? Now think of this. So if, 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 if I'm one of the disciples and Jesus suggests that we head across to the other side of the lake over to the, 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 the garrisons, the gatherings, when I get out of the boat, what are you and I going to be doing? Our head's going to be like on a swivel, is it not? Right? Eyes wide open, fully alert for this demon-possessed man watching for him, right? So, so you cannot convince me that Jesus did not have some kind of a mischievous sense of humor. I, I'm, I'm sticking to my story on this. No, no, don't miss this, though. Jesus is in the business, friends, of shaping our faith, which is why Jesus places his friends, his disciples, into his this situation. 
Because when your and my fears are exposed, the gunk in us comes out, right? It comes surfacing to the, to the top. You know, if we read just a few verses previous to this in Mark chapter 4, you will read and I will read about a story where Jesus is in, as they're crossing across the lake to get to this various very place or location on the shoreline, the Bible tells us in Mark chapter 4 that Jesus and his disciples, they, they, they encounter this incredible violent storm. In fact, the storm is so violent that the Bible says that these, these fishermen here in verse 38, that they're afraid of drowning, which tells me it's a big storm. I mean, if you're a professional fisherman, you would think you would know how to fish. And so if they're afraid of drowning, you know it's bad. But I want you to notice, and it's important, what Jesus says here in, in verse, verse 40. He, so the guys wake him up, and then he asks them this question. He says, guys, why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? And then he follows it up with the question, basically, where's your faith? Where's your faith? Now, now don't miss this. I want to propose that Jesus invites us, you and me, to face our fears. Okay, so write this down, point number one in your notes. Pain has a backstory. Pain has a backstory. Now, what's the backstory? Let's keep reading and then we'll dig in further. Verse 6. So, when Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to him, and bowed low before him. With a shriek, he screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said to the Spirit, Come out of the man, you evil spirit. And then Jesus demanded, What is your name? What is your name? Okay, participation time. All eyes on me. Friends, have you learned yet in life that pain has layers? That pain is, is messy? That pain usually has a backstory? Now think about this, church. What do you suppose was the backstory for this demon-possessed man? Like, how does a person become possessed with the legion of demons? Right, a legion we know in military was like a thousand. So I don't know if the guy had a thousand demons in. But how do you get to that place where you're filled with so many demons? You know, what events and what choices in this man's story led him to be in this painful predicament that he now finds himself in? I mean, what do you think this guy looked like? You know, I've never been shackled with, with metal chains or, you know, implements on my, on my wrists or my legs or my bodies. But I would imagine if I have the ability, if I'm strong enough to, to break these chains, which is what the Bible says here in these verses, don't you think that that would likely leave a mark? You know, don't you think that in the process of, of breaking these metal, you know, contraptions, these metal holdings, it would maybe leave you bruised and bleeding? You know, the Bible also tells us here in verse 5 that the man was a cutter, right? He, he cut himself with stones. Wandering around day and night in the hills and the cemeteries, howling like a, a frenzied, you know, wolf. You know, obviously the man was in incredible pain, yes. Obviously he is traumatized, yes. Which reinforces this truth that pain cripples. Now write this down. Pain drives people. I submit to you today, based upon this story and in my own personal experience, that pain drives people. You know, have you learned yet how when people act a certain way, whether they're defensive or maybe they respond harshly, that there's usually a reason for it? 
You know, some of you know the story how years ago I was counseling this woman and I can remember she came into, the, into, our, into our office. I, I, didn't, I didn't really know her, but uh, I was the guy who did the counseling on our, on our staff. And so she came into our church and as we sat down and she started to kind of unpack her story with me, I can remember very distinctly uh, just kind of brushing my hair. I had hair back then. <laughs> brushing kind of the hair off off the side of my face and when I, when that simple gesture she responded she kind of flinched and she threw up her arm and instantly i knew that her husband was hitting her right in a similar way i submit that when people respond strongly i tend to ask the question internally wow that's a strong reaction. I wonder what's causing it. Which reinforces this truth that pain has a backstory. And that pain drives people. I, I learned a long time ago, in fact, this is one of my favorite sayings. If you go to my Facebook pages, you know, you can put in these favorite, favorite sayings. This is my favorite saying. The issue is never the issue. Right? The issue is never the issue. When people get upset, with me or at others, rarely will I at first glance look at what they're getting upset at. Usually, and almost always, I will ask the question, huh, what's going on behind the scenes? Why? Because there's usually more. Now back to our story. What is your name? Jesus asks. Legion was a response. Now don't miss this. Notice that it wasn't the man who responded. Rather, we're told here, it was the legion who responded. Friends, this is good. Don't miss it. And I say it's good because it struck me as new. And it was like, ah, this is good. Don't miss this. You ready? I think and I submit that pain often speaks for us. Pain often tries to represent us. You know, friends, the devil wants you to believe that you are what your pain says you are. The devil wants you to believe that you are defined by your mistakes and your failures and your bruises. But friends, I want to encourage you to believe and I want to encourage you to hold on to the truth that Jesus liberates and Jesus liberates us. Get this by stepping into our pain. Will you let him? Will you run to Jesus like this man did and invite Jesus into your pain? You know, I don't think it was an accident that Jesus went to this cemetery. I don't think it was by happenstance that Jesus sought an audience with this demon-possessed man. And nor do I believe that you are tuning in today by coincidence. In fact, I propose that Jesus wants to liberate you and me from our fears. So let's pray a prayer. We're going to pray a couple prayers today in this broadcast. The first one is this. Palms open, heart open, mind open. Simply say, Jesus I invite you to step into my pain. Jesus, I invite you to step in to my story. Good. Let's keep reading. Verse 9. Then Jesus demanded, what's your name? And he replied, my name is Legion because there are many of us inside this man. Then the evil spirits begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the spirit begged. Let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission. The evil spirits came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. The herdsmen fled to the nearby towns and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. 
People rushed out to see what had happened. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. Check this, picture it in your mind. He was sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane and they were all afraid. They were all afraid. Now this is really important, so write this down. Point number two. Fear promotes a false narrative. Fear promotes a false narrative. The Bible writer tells us that this demon-possessed man is healed, yes? And when the villagers arrive and they find this man sitting fully clothed and perfectly sane, right? He's not around howling around like a, a, a crazed animal. He's got clothes on, which suggests what? I think it suggests that he, maybe his normal outfit was his birthday suit. That was likely, strong likelihood that if you went to the cemetery, you would find him roaming around buck naked. But now as they arrive here on the scene, what do they find? Well, they find this guy who's, who's not threatening anybody. Strong likelihood that they find him conversing, you know, just casually with Jesus and his disciples. In fact, I don't even think it's beyond the suggestion that he probably even greeted people when they came, right? Hey, Scotty, how's it going? You know, what's the new in the brisket business? Hey, hey, Vanita. Hey, Virginia. How, how, how are your grandkids? Hey, Al, what's new with the radio station, right? If they had radio stations back then. People, the Bible says, are freaked out, aren't they? People are feeling afraid. Why? Church, why are the people afraid? I think they're afraid. Because this guy had a reputation of beating people up, did he not? Now, don't miss this. There's no current th threat right now, is it? This guy's healed. Th these people aren't at risk. And yet, they're still worried about what might happen. And I think that's a great example of what fear looks like. Fear promotes this false narrative. Right? They're afraid that, that they're going to get hurt, when in reality, there's no reason for them to be fear getting hurt. Why? Because the man is healed. And I suspect some of you watching here today are afraid to go swimming in the ocean. Why? Because I might get attacked by sharks. You've never been in the ocean and seen a shark. Maybe, maybe your fear comes from <laughs> watching the movie Jaws or something like that, yet it's a real fear, is it not? You know, statistics tell us that the chances are pretty remote that, you, that you're going to get bit by a shark, let alone meet one. But it reinforces this truth that fear promotes this false narrative. You know, some of you might be hesitant to go on a hike or go backpacking. Why? Because you might see a snake, right? And you hate snakes. Or maybe you don't want to go backpacking because you might face a bear and you don't like bears. And so what do you do? Well, we stay home, right? We miss out on enjoying God's beautiful creation, all because fear promotes this false narrative. Let's continue to bring it home. Think about this COVID-19 season that we've been in the last three and a half months, right? What fears has COVID-19 fostered in some of you? Well, I gotta hunker down, right? I can't go out. If I go out, I might get sick. You know, if I go out, I might, I might get my parents sick or those I love sick or you fill in the blank. You know, our daughter Casey, she manages Sidecar Donuts, which is a pretty popular place out here in Southern California. And there was many, many weeks where she wouldn't even come over to the house because she was in contact with so many people. She, she was being cautious. She's being careful. You know, for those of you who have ever been hurt in a relationship, and we've talked about this already, you know, you've had your heart ripped out or you've had your heart wounded or maybe you've been betrayed. Wow, it's hard to put yourself out there again, isn't it? 
It's hard to trust people again, isn't it? Why? Because fear imprisons. Fear imprisons. So I invite you to pray another prayer with me, okay? Palms open, heart open, mind open. Would you ask, would you just say, please Jesus, help me to say no to fear. And please Jesus, help me to say no to false narratives. Good, amen. Let's wrap things up. Verse 15, verse 15. So a crowd soon gathered around Jesus and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. He was sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane and they were all afraid, verse 16. Then those who had seen what had happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and the pigs. Now get this. These people were afraid of, of seeing this man healed. They were afraid of this false narrative of what might happen and many of them didn't even know about the pigs yet. It says, only then did, did the people tell them about the pigs, verse 17. And so the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. People are now more afraid of Jesus than they are of this formerly demon-possessed man. And so the Bible tells us that they, they, they ask him to leave, which really reinforces this truth that change is scary, is it not? Change is it's frightening. So what's Jesus do? He acquiesces. Verse 18, let's wrap it up. So as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. But Jesus said, no, go home to your family. And tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. Verse 20, don't miss this. So the man started off to visit the ten towns of that region and began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them. Final point, write this down. Jesus invites me to live into a new storyline. Jesus invites me to live into a new storyline. Brothers and sisters, everybody has a story. You do, I do, and Jesus invites us to tell our story. Why? Well, because our story is what people relate to, do they not? Listen, your friend, fear, and your pain in your story is what people can relate to. Why? Because I think and I've learned that people often relate better to my struggles than they do my wins. Right? I was drunk, but now I'm sober. I was broken, but now Jesus is healing me. I was lost, but now I have a road map, right? I was a relational casualty, but Jesus is helping me learn to trust again. I was in chains, but Jesus is giving me freedom. I was afraid, but now Jesus is, is instilling within my heart and my, 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 my being this new courage. I was a liar and a cheat, but now I speak the truth. I was abandoned. But now I have a family, a church family. I was a rebel, but now I'm a rebel with a cause. My pain and my fear tell a story. And brothers and sisters, people relate to stories. You know what else people relate to in our story? My freedom. I think freedom also can be found in our story. I think freedom tells a story, and I want to suggest that freedom invites a response. Jesus came for the sinner. Jesus came for the sick. Jesus, the Bible tells us, came to seek and save the lost and those who were hurting. 
Over and over, the Bible reinforces for you and for me, not just in this story in Mark chapter five, but throughout the scriptures, that Jesus steps into our fears. Jesus steps into my pain. Jesus steps into my baggage. Listen, for some of us, this COVID-19 season feels scary. Yes? Brothers and sisters, that's okay. Jesus gets it. Jesus understands. Jesus doesn't shame you. And I'm certainly not trying to, believe it or not. But what Jesus does do is that he invites you and he invites me to trust him. Will you trust him? Jesus invites you and me to focus our mind and our heart upon who he is, not on what might happen. Friends, pain cripples and fear imprisons. But the hope of this story is the truth that Jesus liberates. Jesus liberates. So I want to invite you to close one final prayer. Hands open, heart open, mind open, and just say, Jesus, today, would you please give me the strength to step into a new storyline? Jesus, will you help me to live free and unshackled? And Jesus, will you help me to tell my story? In fact, give me courage to tell my story. Amen. I want to thank you for listening. Wherever you might be tuning in from all over the country, thank you for sharing your time and your home with me. And I just really want to reinforce this truth that your pain and your struggles and your fears are actually the thing that people are going to relate to. So don't be afraid of talking about that stuff. Don't be afraid of letting people in because if you trust the Lord, those are the things that he's actually going to use to empower other people and break their chains. And so I just bless you today in the name of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And I encourage you to look this week, right? Eyes wide open, head on a swivel for those opportunities to step into people's pain, to step into people's challenges and walk with them and be their source of strength, even as Jesus was for this man here. Friends, God bless you. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next week.